So, I uh, got a word for you. You want to see how this word lands on your brain. The word irrational. I mean, what comes to mind when you think of the word irrational? Probably not good things. Because when we're being irrational, we're not making sense. When we're being irrational, we are not being logical. When we're being irrational, we are, I don't know, we're being unreasonable. And, and, and that kind of goes against the idea of being irrational. It goes against our, our heritage as Methodists, right? Because there was this guy named John Wesley who started the Methodist movement. And he started it with a, a group of college friends. And in college, they were so structured about their lives, uh, what time they got up in the morning and, and uh, how they prayed throughout the day. They would record their thoughts and what they were thinking about kind of in 15-minute 15, 15 increments in their journals so they would know what it was that they were processing and how God was working in their lives. They were meticulous about how they served the neediest people in their culture. They were meticulous about how they visited prisons and made sure the prisoners knew that they were not alone in, in whatever was going through their lives. And they were meticulous about everything in their lives. And so this John Wesley and this group of people got called Methodists because they were methodical. And it was a slam on them. But John Wesley's like, hey, I'll take that and run with it. Because if being methodical helps me to know Jesus more and follow Jesus more deeply and to serve the world uh, more fully, then call me a Methodist. Because it was all about being rational and reasonable and faithful. In fact, the movement that John Wesley started was one of, of a thinking faith and a feeling faith. One that we could experience the real presence of God and we could have a thought out faith and a faith that worked itself out in the world, right? That did things, that helped people, that followed God's call to go do and to be. It was all logical and rational, but I think John Wesley would like what we're talking about today and in the next couple of weeks. Because we're talking about this is what we do. And today we're talking about this is what we do as we live out our mission in irrational generosity. Because in the world's way of looking at what we do, it seems a little crazy what we do. Irrational generosity. I heard this phrase a while back that we're going to process for a minute. Most Americans don't feel rich and we are. Most Americans think we are generous and we are not. Most of us feel like we're not rich. Why is the reason that we don't feel rich as Americans? It's probably because there's always somebody richer than us. If there's somebody richer than you, then you feel like, gosh, I am not rich because somebody, that person is rich, not me. But here's a better way to, to measure if we're rich or not. So maybe you had an experience like this this last week. You got in your car, and uh, you passed by, I don't know, five or seven different restaurants to get to the one that you wanted to go to, and maybe you were a little miffed if you had to wait five minutes to get into that restaurant that you love, and you, you ordered the, your favorite food. What is that favorite food in your favorite restaurant? Picture that. Mmm, getting you hungry here. There are donuts out there waiting for you afterwards. So, you, so you, you, you order your favorite food, someone comes and brings that food to your table, you enjoy that, that meal, then someone comes and cleans the table off for you, then you, you, write, you, know, you, you pay the bill without really blinking an eye, and then you get back in your car and you head home. And if you're like us, when you drive up to your home, you click a button and the garage door opens. The garage, which is actually a home for your car. You, you drive your car into its own home, and you get out of that car, and you go into your home, which is probably climate-controlled, right? You, are you ever just kind of pinpoint some things in life and say, I am thankful for my garage door? Have any, you ever have that moment when you're like, I am thankful that my house is climate-controlled? Do you ever have those moments? You should. You know, so, so you enjoy all of that. Then at some point, at some point, you've got to go to the bathroom. Yeah, we're going to get real here for a minute. When you go to the bathroom, you push a button and your stuff goes away. Isn't that nice? If you aren't giving thanks for that on a fairly regular basis, that you push a button and your stuff goes away, you are missing out on an important moment of gratitude in life. Because most of the rest of the world, you know, when they go, they push a button, their stuff doesn't go away. It just stays in a hole somewhere. Wow, we are truly rich to be able to do that. 
You go to sleep in an actual bed, you wake up the next day, you walk into your closet, you got clothes on both sides of that room. Your clothes have their own house inside your, your car has its own house. Your clothes have its own house. Some of us have like two stories of clothes in our, our closets. How amazing is that? And I could go on and on, but that's how rich we are. Most of us don't think we, we're rich and we are. Most of us think we are generous and we're not. So you ask the average American, are you generous? They're going to say, yeah, I, I really think I am pretty generous. But we're really not overall. Last year, Americans gave away, you ready? They gave away a whopping 1.7% of their income. Boy, that had to hurt, didn't it? 1.7%. It's the lowest percentage that Americans have given away in almost 30 years, 1.7%. Oh, by the way, if you're really blessed financially, that percentage goes down. Interesting. Fewer and fewer Americans actually give anything at all to charitable causes, but that's not what we do. As followers of Jesus, we do something different. We lead the way with what we're calling today irrational generosity because we truly believe it's better to give than to what? It's better to give than to receive. Why do we believe that? A couple of reasons. One, Jesus told us that. Those were words that came out of his mouth. Jesus said it. And then Jesus modeled it too. It's better to give. He gave his life, gave his entirety for us. But every day people say, you know, I'd love to give so much more. I'd love to give so much more. Why don't we give more? Why aren't we more generous than we we say we are? Why, Why don't we? Well, the reason that we don't is because we feel like we can't, not because we don't want to. We feel like we can't, not because we don't want to. And I get that. It's a scarcity mindset, um, and uh, maybe you were raised like me. I, I grew up in a household that there was a, I couldn't name it at the time, of course, but there was a scarcity mindset. We didn't talk about money at all in our house. And because of that scarcity mindset, there was this kind of feeling and just, I don't know, little phrases, words dropped here and there from my parents that were like, you know, there might not be enough. There might not be enough. There always was, but there might not be enough. It was a scarcity mindset that really pervaded our household and, and there's a cycle to a scarcity mindset. I want to name, and maybe it'll be helpful for us as a tool, a scarcity cycle. And here's what the scarcity cycle looks like. We'll put it up there. And what you see on the scarcity cycle is, first of all, God supplies. And this is, that's a foundational understanding that, that God provides everything we need. Um, you know, God isn't writing you a paycheck every month, but God's giving you the ability to work, right? And all the different things that, that God supplies. We have things because God supplies. And in the scarcity cycle, what's the first thing we do? We consume. We get something, we use it all up for us. We consume it as soon as we get it. And then as soon as we consume it all, what do we experience? Lack. It's all gone. I got nothing. And then when we have that, uh, that sense of it's all gone, then what's the next thing in the cycle? We fear. We're afraid. It's just natural. It's when, we, when we don't feel like we have enough, we're afraid. And then we get another paycheck and we start the cycle all over again. Consume, we lack we fear. We consume. We lack. We fear. We say things like, I wish I could do more, but I can't. I never seem to get ahead. We say things like, no matter what I do, there's just never enough. It's a cycle of scarcity. It's a scarcity mindset. As Jesus followers, though, what we strive to do, strive to have, is a different mindset. A different mindset. And the mindset begins because, in this way, that God has done something for us, and because of what God has done, something different for us, we do something different first than the, scarcity, than the scarcity cycle. We do something different first, and it's a cycle of supply or a cycle of abundance. You might put it that way. Here's uh, what scripture tells us. This is Paul writing. He's writing to a church in the city of Corinth. And Paul's the guy that wrote a big chunk of our New Testament, right? Letters to churches, to people. That makes up a big part of our, our scriptures. He writes this. Remember this, He's talking about generosity here. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a small, uh, who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. 
And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer, then bread to eat. In the same way, God will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. You see, it's a cycle. We, we receive, and well, I'll put it up there. Here's the graphic, uh, and we've got both of them. So on, on the left-hand side, that's the scarcity cycle. This is the cycle of supply and abundance. And you notice that the first thing that happens in the cycle of abundance makes all the difference in the world. The first thing, because the first thing in the cycle of abundance is we give instead of consume. We give first. We worship God with the tithe. The tithe is meant to be the first part of what we have. We give back to God. The tithe, I've mentioned that word. I don't know if, if that's a familiar term to you or not, but it comes from a Hebrew word that's uh, mazer is the Hebrew word, and it means one-tenth. And the idea for our spiritual ancestors was God saying, okay, trust me on this. Bring that tenth to me. Bring that tenth as an act of worship and see what happens in your life. One-tenth of everything that comes to us, we give back to God. God multiplies that, builds it, and builds our faith. And suddenly we're in a different cycle, this, the cycle of, of supply. And let's unpack this, uh, this idea of the tithe and putting God first. That, that's what it does. Uh, scripture tells us this, and there, there are a couple things that tithe does. It teaches us to put God first. And the scripture behind that is Deuteronomy 14, plain and simple in the Living Bible. It says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. And I don't know, you might be thinking this, well, Aaron, I don't know if you understand my story, but this is scary to put God first, especially financially. That'd be scary. Times are tight. I don't really want to do this. Aaron, for me to tithe would take me rearranging my whole life around God. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. The tithe is that, that outward act of something we've chosen inside to say, yep, God, you are number one. Now, to do that would be crazy and, and crazy faith. Aaron, is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. That's what I'm telling you because it takes Faith to give first, it doesn't take faith to give last. Mm. Tithing, every time I receive an increase from God, it reminds me in a very tangible way, God, because of what you did for me, it is my honor to give back to you. I worship you through this act of putting you first. As the Lord of all, I put you first. Tithing teaches us to put God first. Second thing that tithing does is that it builds our faith. We see the faithfulness of God and, and we see what God tells us to do and what God's response is. This is Malachi. Malachi was a prophet in the Old Testament and God spoke through the prophets. So the prophets would write down what they believed they heard God saying to them. And so this is God speaking through Malachi. God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. By the way, this is the only place in, in the whole Bible that we have. It's the only place where God says, put me to the test. Only place. And God's like saying, hey, my economy works differently than the world's economy. God's saying, the world says consume, lack, fear. Consume, lack, fear. See if when you give to me first, I don't multiply and build your faith and suddenly create a harvest of generosity. Just see, test me on this. Test me on this. Test me on this. Uh, let me uh, tell you what happened to me a few years ago. I uh, went to a conference in Los Angeles. It was called the Maxwell Exchange. Uh, there's a, a business leader called John Maxwell. This was not really a Christian conference. It was kind of a business conference, but um, John Maxwell hosted it, and uh, the theme that year was uh, uh, about presentations and, and, and Shark Tank was kind of the theme. Anybody familiar with Shark Tank? Anybody? Not too many people. Barbara Corcoran, okay, I see a few. Barbara Corcoran is one of the uh, original sharks, you know. So what, what, what happened at the, before we actually got to the conference is they sent out an invitation to everybody that was attending the conference to say, hey, you have a chance to make a pitch 
in front of the sharks, right? And the sharks were Barbara Corcoran and uh, John Maxwell. And the pitch was for $20,000 for a nonprofit of your choice. So I was on the board of uh, an, uh, an organization called Ascent Recovery Residences. And it was a, a recovery house, several recovery houses for people that wanted to break the chains and the slavery of addiction in their lives. And so I'm like, all right, can't hurt to apply to try and give a pitch. I didn't know how many people would be giving pitches, but I'm like, all right, I can do this and uh, I can't not do it. You know, like, gosh, it could really help the organization that I was serving on their board. And so I, I filled out an application, put in everything in, had to do a video, turn all that in. And I was chosen to be one of three people to give a pitch in front of the sharks, Barbara Cor Corcoran and John Maxwell. The, the pitches were to be two minutes long. And I got to tell you, I have never been more nervous in my life. You know, acid reflux nerves and the heart rate pounding nerves. And oh, it was just terrible. I've never been more nervous because of just the nature of it. Having only two minutes. You, you, have you noticed I don't usually speak for just two minutes? I mean, I've noticed that. Um, two minutes and in front of the sharks and in front of the entire conference. The whole conference is sitting out there listening. So there were three of us that made our our pitches in front of the, uh, the, the two judges, uh, two sharks. And then afterwards, they asked us a question, and then they awarded the $20,000. So we presented, and they chose the winner, and I was not the winner. Yeah, well, you were hoping that would turn out differently, weren't you? There was a real estate agent. His name was Scott Tolar, who did a pitch for a center for mentally disabled adults. He is the one who won, and that's Scott in the middle. That's Barbara Corkin on the left side, uh, John Maxwell on the right side, and the three of us that made the presentation. So they gave him a check for $20,000, and as soon as he received the check, he said, hold on a second, I I've got something I want to say. He said, um, I have a matching grant back home through my organization. So what I'd like to do is take $10,000 of this $20,000 and give $5,000 to each of the other two presenters. Wow, what an amazing act of generosity gets better from there. So um, he's, because he was saying like, I can still get $20,000 because I'll get a matching, matching grant. Well, Barbara Corcoran stood up at that point and said, no, 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 uh, Scott, you you keep the $20,000 check and it'll become $40,000 check, uh, 40,000. I'll give $10,000 each to the other two presenters so that they can take something back to their organizations. And isn't that awesome? Gets better. It gets better. No way. It gets better. <laughs> then, then at that point, John Maxwell stood up and said, well, I can't have Barbara Corcoran outdo me. <laughs> and he said, I will also give $10,000 each to the other two participants who didn't win the presentation. See what happened? Scott Tolar. What did he do first? What did he do first? He gave first. And that $20,000 became $80,000. 40 for him and 20 for each of us that we took back to our organizations. See how it works? God's economy is so irrational. But it works. God says, test me on this. See what happens. Put me first. And it's not a guarantee that every time that's going to happen, right? That's not why we do it. So, hey, God, I'm playing the math here and you better do. No, it's just, it's living that lifestyle consistently. We see that rather than consuming first, if we give first, it begins a whole different cycle. And there's a harvest of generosity. God's saying, give me your first and best. I'll bless the rest. Something powerful about that. This is what we do. This is why this is irrational. Because of what Jesus did, this is what we do. And I have no problem talking about generosity and tithing because for 30 years I've seen it unfold in people's lives. And, and not just so that churches and other organizations can have the funding they need to live out their mission. But what it does in us when we individually practice generosity is utterly amazing. I've seen it happen, and I'm honored to worship Jesus and put my trust in him and practice the tithe. I've been, my, Janet, my wife Janet and I have been doing it for 30 years. It's irrational, but this is what we do. Here's a hard question to ask. This is what we do. Are you a part of the we? Or are you still living in that scarcity cycle? And if you are living in that scarcity cycle, what does it take to get out? You got to change the first thing you do when you receive. 
Instead of consume, you make that irrational choice to give. I mean, it makes no sense in the natural world because it's supernatural. We give, God multiplies, our faith grows, we give more, and the world changes. You know, when we give through our church, I mean, you're going to see more of this in the weeks to come. But when we live out our mission of connecting people to Jesus, building a movement where all are included, accepted, and loved, and we give generously to see that happen, we're making an impact. We're making an impact on illiteracy. We're making an impact on poverty. We're making an impact on the spiritual lives of lots of people in eastern Jackson County. It's, I don't know, that's what happens when we are on mission and we give irrationally. It's who we are. And so I want to invite you. I'll wrap up with this. I want to invite you. If you're not a part of the we, then make the next decision, the next right decision to say, okay, I want to try it. I want to try it. In two weeks, we've got Commitment Sunday. And use that to start a new cycle. You know, everybody will get a commitment card. And by the way, if you are a member of Woods Chapel, you've already said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about it, think about it, talk about it, and fill that card out. If you're a member of Woods Chapel, you've already said you're going to do that. So just do it. But I don't know, maybe you're going to be making that decision. I would just say, choose to do the right thing first and start a new cycle. This is what we do. And God is glorified when we give And God meets needs all over the world. This is what we do. And it changes the world. And for today, that is the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.